Welcome to the online services for Akadu and Cross Car Presbyterian Churches for Sunday the 2nd of August 2020. And whether you're a member of other congregation, a friend or a visitor, you're very welcome as we join in worshipping God together. I want to acknowledge those who will contribute to this morning service. Ronnie, who will lead us later in our prayers and intercession. Louise, who will read God's word to us, and then Dan, who will speak to the boys and girls. So thank you to these three individuals for their contribution to the service this morning. And again to Jill for the great work in editing and preparing all the various items for the service. Uh, There are four praise items as normal, Um, but just want to acknowledge uh, some girls from the congregations who joined together and recorded the final piece, God, for us. And they are Maddie and Karen, Iona, Catherine and Charmaine. And I know that you will enjoy the final piece as you hear it uh, later in the service. A very powerful message to us. In the incoming week, I will be on holiday. And so for members of Akadu and Cross Guard, if you require the services of a minister, Please get in contact with the relevant clerks of session, William Knox in Akadui and William Reed in Crossgar. And they will uh, know which minister uh, to contact on your behalf. There will be no online service recorded for next week, but we encourage you to use the link that is on our web page uh, to listen to the moderator service. And our moderator has provided a service Sunday by Sunday. And I know many of you already listened to that, and we encourage you to do so uh, next Sunday as well. And we remember uh, the Reverend Dr. David Bruce in his time as moderator. And then just to update you, in recent weeks we've had uh, meetings of both Kirk Sessions and both congregational committees. And the decision taken by Kirk Session in both Akadu and Crossgar is to aim at returning to meeting in the church premises on the first Sunday in September. There are many plans still to finalise, but you will get full details by means of letter in a few weeks' time. So that's just to give you a warning that we're looking at the beginning of September. And then also to remind um, our Kirk session, or sorry, our congregation committee in Abidu, that you have a meeting on the 10th of August at 8 p.m. And then the subcommittee of that of the Cross Gar Congregation Committee meet the following evening on Tuesday the 11th of August at 7.30 p.m. So please remember those dates. And then just advance warning, we'll not be back in the church building until September. And so on the third Saturday um, of August, it will be possible to bring contributions to both churches and also to bring items for the local food bank uh, here in Akadui. And your support is indeed appreciated over recent weeks. But as we come to worship God, today we're going to be thinking about the theme of contentment, looking at Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 13. Let us just seek God's blessing upon this time of worship. Let us pray. Father, we rejoice that we can come to you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour. And we pray, Lord, for your blessing upon all uh, that will be said, all that will take place. And we ask, indeed, that you would speak very powerfully into our situations, that what we hear will be both relevant and challenging, and that Jesus will be honoured. In his precious name we pray. Amen. And fullness of joy In worship and wonder I behold your face Singing what a faithful God have I What a faithful God have I What a faithful God What a faithful God Mercy, you have. 
sovereign granting peace from hell let me comfort those who suffer with the comfort you have given i will tell of your great love for as long as i live singing what a faithful Let us join in prayer. Father, we thank you for the sentiments of the opening praise brought to us by Colin. And we thank you indeed that you are a faithful God, an unchanging God. And Lord, we thank you that we have access to you through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Saviour. We come at an uncertain time and we praise you that your love and your goodness and your grace is certain that, Lord, you change not, that, Lord, you are a gracious and a loving God, a compassionate and a caring God. Lord, you know our needs. You are faithful in every way. And we thank you indeed that you're a God who has answered our prayers in the past. And so we can come with boldness and confidence into your presence. We come acknowledging that you're the one true and living God, the God who is the creator of all things, and the God who is the sustainer of all life. And Lord, indeed, we know that we cannot live or move or have our being apart from you. We indeed acknowledge that you are everything to us, and we come humbly seeking your hand of blessing upon us as we worship you. Lord, we thank you for your word that we have been studying, particularly the book of Philippines, and we thank you for the Apostle Paul and all the letters that he wrote inspired by your Holy Spirit. As we come today to think particularly on the theme of contentment, we know we live at a time when so many lack contentment. So many are searching for satisfaction, for contentment, for joy. And yet we know that true contentment, true joy, true fulfillment is found only in Jesus Christ. It's found in having a personal relationship with him and so we pray today that you would challenge us that you would refresh us and in everything we pray that jesus will be glorified and honored that lord you will point to us to the savior we acknowledge that over and over again we feel you we acknowledge that so often we know the things we should do and yet in our weakness we leave them undone and equally we know the things that we should not do when we are tempted yet we often give in and we do these things lord forgive us for our weakness and lord strengthen us and give us courage and boldness help us to stand firm in our faith and help us to be that faithful witness that you desire us to be we thank you for all who will listen and watch this service today and lord you know their individual circumstances we just pray that you will draw very near to each one. And we pray that you administer into each situation. Lord, we thank you that you're the God who knows our needs and the God who is able to meet each and every need. We pray, Lord, for your blessing, for your refreshment, and for your encouragement. We commit this time of worship to you. And we pray, Lord, that our worship will be acceptable in your sight. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Philippians 4, verse 10 to 13. I rejoice greatly in the Lord, that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Amen. Hello everyone and um, welcome boys and girls because um, I'm going to be um, sharing the children's address now with you guys. Um, so this is what we're going to be looking at today. It's a wee book that I've had for ages and it's called You Are Special. I'm just going to uh, hold the words up um, to the screen and hopefully you guys um, can follow and read along with me. So we've just got to get straight into it here. The Wemmicks were small wooden people carved by a woodworker named Eli. Each Wemmick was different. Some had big noses, others had large eyes, some were tall and others were short. Each Wemmick had a box of golden star stickers and a box of grey dot stickers. The wooden people went around the village sticking stars or dots on one another. The pretty ones got stars. Wemmicks with rough wood or chipped paint got dots. The talented ones got stars too. Some could jump over tall boxes or sing pretty songs. Others though could do little and they got dots. Punicello was one of these. He tried to jump high like the others, but he always fell. So Wemmicks would give him dots. When he tried to explain why he'd fallen, he'd say something silly and then Wemmicks would give him more dots. He deserves a lot of dots, the wooden people would say. After a while, Punicello believed them. I'm not a good Wemmick, he decided, so he stayed inside most of the time. When he did go outside, he hung around with other Wemmicks who also had lots of dots. He felt better around them. One day, he met a different kind of Wemmick named Lucia. She had no dots or stars. The Wemmicks admired Lucia for having no dots, so they would give her a star, but it would fall off. Others gave her a dot for having no stars, but that wouldn't stick either. That's why, that's the way I want it to be, thought Punicello, so he asked Lucia how she did it. It's easy, she replied. Every day I visit Eli, the woodcarver. Why? You'll find out if you go and see him. Then Lucia turned and slipped away. But will he want to see me? Punicello wondered. Later at home, he sat and watched the wooden people giving each other stars and dots. It's not right, he muttered to himself. And then he decided to go and see Eli. Punicello walked up to the walked up the narrow path and stepped into Eli's shop. His eyes grew big. The stool was as tall as he was. He had to stretch on tiptoe to see the top of the wood bench, workbench. Punicello swallowed hard. I'm not staying here. Then he heard his name. Punicello! The voice was deep and strong. How good to see you. Come, let me have a look at you. Punicello looked up. You know my name? Of course. I made you. Oh. Eli picked him up and set him on the bench. Looks like you've been given some bad marks, said the maker. I didn't mean to, Eli. I tried really hard. Punicello, I don't care what the other Wemmicks think. You don't? No, you shouldn't either. What they think doesn't matter. All that matters is what I think. And I think you're very special. Punicello laughed. Me? Special? Why? I'm not very talented and my paint is peeling. Why do I matter to you? Eli spoke slow, so, so, slow, uh, slowly. Because you're mine. 
That's why you matter to me. Punicello didn't know what to say. Every day I've been hoping you'd come, Eli explained. I came because I met Lucia, said Punicello. Why don't the stickers stay on her? The maker spoke soft, softly because she decided that what I think is more important than what others think. The stickers only stick if you let them. What? The stickers only stick if they matter to you. The more you trust my love, the less you care about their stickers. I'm not sure I understand. Eli smiled. Eli smiled. You will. But it will take time. For now, come and see me every day and let me remind you how much I care. Eli lifted Punicello off the bench and set him on the ground. Remember, Eli said as Punicello was leaving, you are special because I made you and I don't make mistakes. Punicello didn't stop, but his heart thought, I think he really means it. And when he did, a dot fell to the ground. So that's the end um, of the book, You Are Special. So what can we learn from this today? Well, thankfully, we are all different. And even me, um, I'm an identical twin. You probably saw Johnny um, walking around and maybe thought it was me. But um, we are different. We have our differences, even though we might look for it um, to you the same. We are different. Um, you might like different music to your friends. You might like different sports. You might have different talents. You might be really good at singing. Um, you might have a funny or weird, weird laugh. Um, but oh, or maybe a different haircut or maybe you don't look, um, the same as one of your best friends. But that, remember that doesn't matter. And being different isn't a bad thing because God loves us and we're all precious in his eyes. Um, we're unique because he made us. And in Psalm 139, it says, um, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. So um, Reverend Knox um, today will be speaking um, in Philippians and we can be content um, in Christ. And we can be content in how we look. And we don't have to compare ourselves to others. Um, so young people and um, boys and girls, don't worry. Um, if you feel out of place or different, that's fine. Um, because God made made you, um, and He loves you. So, um, that's me. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you later. <laughs>
in recent years. We pray for the elderly in our congregation who often feel lonely and isolated. May you surround them with your love and give strength and blessing to them and to those who care for them. We pray for those who are anxious about family members or themselves, for those awaiting hospital results and for those who fear losing their jobs or businesses due to the coronavirus. May they not be anxious, but turn to you in prayer and trust in you to provide all their needs. We pray for those who have recently been bereaved through illness or tragic accidents. Surround them with your love and may they be aware of your presence as they go through this difficult time in their lives. We thank you for the beautiful weather we enjoyed in the springtime and the crops it produced and we ask for favourable weather to bring in the harvest. We give thanks that in your word you said as long as earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. We thank you that we have never experienced real hunger or thirst and we have an abundance of everything. Help us to show greater compassion to those who suffer. We think of our missionaries away in countries where the coronavirus is spreading rapidly as people are unable to distance from each other and hygiene and washing is not easily maintained with little medical care available. Keep them safe and we thank you that through our prayers and financial support they can bring the message of salvation and help to change the lives of so many both physically and spiritually. We thank you for the ongoing work among the youth in our church and ask that you give guidance to the leaders. We pray for the young people with so many temptations in our world today that they may come to know you early in their lives and be an example to their friends. As we make plans to return again into our church, we ask for wisdom as we decide the steps needed to keep people safe from the virus. We pray for Knops, Roberta and family as they get to know the members of both congregations and the needs of each family. Bless Knox as he prepares and delivers such a clear and challenging message each week. May we all be challenged and live each day more pleasing to you and that the lives of many who by hearing about your salvation will put their faith and trust in you. All this we pray in Jesus' name. The story is told of an airline pilot who was flying over Lake in Tennessee. He turned to his co-pilot and he said, See that little lake down there? When I was a kid I used to go out in a rowboat fishing on it. And when a plane flew overhead, I would look up and I would wish I was flying it. But now I look down and I wish I was in that rowboat fishing. And see, that's a good illustration of the discontentment in our culture. So often we go after things that we think will bring satisfaction, only to be left feeling empty and disappointed. The Bible is clear that contentment is not found in things, but in a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Now today, as we focus upon Philippians 4, verses 10 and 13, our theme will be that of contentment. The dictionary tells us that contentment is a state of happiness or satisfaction. A state of happiness and satisfaction. Now the particular dictionary I turn to give an example of the meaning of this word, and this is how the word was used. He found contentment in living a simple life in the country. And you know well, that's interesting because it really sums up how the world in general views contentment. The world tends to see contentment dependent upon circumstances. Circumstances are the key to contentment. 
But you know we need to be conscious that the Christian's view of the past real contentment is very different at its core. This is how one Christian writer described contentment. Contentment is the Christ-empowered willingness to gladly submit to God's wise providence in every situation. I want to highlight two things about contentment from these verses from the Apostle Paul. First of all, very simply, we want to note the struggle for contentment. We live at a time when all of us are affected by a pandemic, COVID-19. However, years ago, one American Christian writer spoke about a different pandemic. He used the phrase pandemic to describe discontentment. This is what he wrote. There is a pandemic of discontent in our culture. And he added this, we're roaming, we're restless, we're discontent. But let me state two reasons why contentment is a struggle. Why it proves elusive to many. First of all, contentment must be cultivated. It must be cultivated. Why? Because it's not natural to mankind. Ever since the beginning of creation, when the first creatures came from the hand of God, there's been someone somewhere who's been discontent, who's been unhappy with his position in the universe. It all began with an angel, Lucifer, the brightest star of the heavenly firmament. He was not satisfied to be the apex of God's creation. He wanted something more than a assigned position as the greatest of all created beings. And this led to rebellion. Because of his discontentment, Satan and a third of the angels rebelled against God. And you know, discontentment has been one of Satan's best weapons ever since. His earliest triumph came in the Garden of Eden when he sowed seeds of discontentment in the heart of Eve. By misquoting the Lord, he made Eve think that God was somehow trying to cheat her, to keep her down, to keep her from becoming like God. And as a result, Eve was tempted and gave in to the temptation. She took fruit and ate it, gave to Adam and he ate it. And you see, the seeds of discontentment in Eve's heart brought forth the bitter harvest of disobedience. And that led to the loss of paradise and the entrance of evil into the world. But after Eden, mankind has never been truly satisfied with anything on earth. And we're still not satisfied thousands of years later. We always want something different. We always want something more. This is how one writer put it. If we're young, we want to be older. If we're old, we wish we were younger. If it's old, we want something new. If it's new, we want something newer. If it's small, we want something bigger. If it's big, we want something really big. We're never content. And certainly Solomon understood that possessions and money don't make us content. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 10, he wrote, The one who loves money is never satisfied with money. And whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with income. You see, whatever we have, if we're looking to it for satisfaction and joy and contentment, it will never be quite enough. And see, this discontentment in our culture is seized upon by those in the advertising industry. Billboards and commercials and pop-up ads all seek to stir a debilitating sense of boredom in mankind. They prey upon that unrest, that discontent in their hearts and souls. And as a consequence, we discard yesterday's fashions, yesterday's toys and technologies into our country's swelling landfills. Dennis Johnson wrote rather tongue-in-cheek that the economic health of our country depends on the cultivation of discontent. The economic health of our country depends upon the cultivation of discontent. Because people aren't content with what they have, they discard it and they buy something newer, something bigger, something better. You see, we all want the latest, the best. We want to feel and look different. Have you ever considered the vast cosmetic surgery industry? It depends upon the discontentment of people. If everyone was content with how God had made them, well then, cosmetic surgeons, they wouldn't have any customers. Contentment is not natural to us. That is why Paul says, I have learned to be content. I have learned to be content. You see, naturally, we're prone to compare ourselves with others. 
We're prone to always want more than we have. To interpret someone else's good fortune as coming at our expense. And we're very prone to complain. And no one has to teach us any of these things. They come naturally to us. Not so with contentment. Contentment is not natural. It is something we must learn over time. And Paul moved, you know, from a state of not being content to a state of knowing contentment. And twice he says, I have learned to be content. Contentment, you know, wasn't zapped into his heart. Through many experiences, Paul learned that Christ was enough, that he was sufficient. See, we don't do something to be content. We learn some things in order to be content. We need to have a new perspective, a new attitude. We need to have a deepened faith. Contentment is not natural to us. But secondly, contentment is unrelated to circumstances. Paul here thanks the Philippians for their generous support of him. He appreciates it deeply. However, he wants them to know that even if they had forgotten him, he had learned to be content. Verse 12, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in each and every circumstance. You see, Paul had lived in both sides of the spectrum. He experienced times of excruciating need, and he also experienced times of plenty. And he had learned the secret of being content in both, in both situations. Paul didn't seek satisfaction in material things when he didn't have them. And he didn't find satisfaction in material things when he did have them. So you're all familiar with being discontent when we have little. But be aware discontentment can also be a problem for people who have much. And here are some of the temptations you face during seasons when you have plenty. First of all, the temptation to find your satisfaction in these things rather than in God. Secondly, the temptation to take pride in your possessions. Thirdly, the temptation to be greedy for more. And finally, the temptation to worry about losing the things that you have gained. As Stephen Fowle puts it, abundance simply shifts one's focus from getting things to keeping the things one has. Abundance simply shifts one's focus from getting things to keeping the things one has. Paul has learned to be content in all circumstances because his contentment is not dependent upon circumstances. And listen to Paul's words to a young man named Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is what he writes. Godliness with contentment is great gain, says Paul, for we brought nothing into the world and we will take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptations and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunges men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this. You see, we are conditioned by our culture to be consumers. And everything around us shouts, get more, get more stuff. But stuff will not satisfy. It will only leave us empty. It will never bring contentment. Note, first of all, the struggle for contentment. But then I want you to note, secondly, the secret of contentment. Paul says, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. And here Paul uses the language of the mystic religions. You see, they claim to have some sort of special knowledge of deep divine secrets possessed only by the initiated. And Paul, if you like, says he has been initiated into what was previously unknown to him, previously hidden from him. He has discovered how to be content in every situation, how to face trials and navigate safely through rough waters without being overwhelmed by a sense of despair. And you see, it's all about focus. To enjoy contentment, there are three things that are important. 
first of all, to rejoice in our substance, to rejoice in our substance. In the portion I shared from 1 Timothy chapter 6, the apostle there was urging Timothy to be satisfied with what he had. Indeed, Paul would remind all of us not to complain about what we lack, instead to thank God for what we have. One writer puts it so aptly, contentment is not having everything we want, but enjoying everything we have. Contentment is not having everything we want, but enjoying everything we have. You see, God knows our needs and God will supply them. He may withhold something that we desperately want from us, but that's because he has something better in store for us. You see, Paul personally experienced times of plenty and times of want, but he was always content. Now consider this reality. Every TV commercial tells us there are things we don't have, but we should have them. And their aim is to get us to add to the list of things that we want. The list of things that we don't have. However, the list of the things that we do have is greater by far. And if we would only pause to acknowledge them, we will be content. Think about family and homes, food and friends, name a few. And if you are a Christian, something far more astounding. A personal relationship with our Creator God, our Redeemer. And you see, when we have a personal relationship with God, that means that we will never face life's trials without his all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful presence. We can rejoice in our substance. But then secondly, if we are to know contentment, we are to rest in our situation. Paul was content because of his dependence on God and his firm conviction that God was sovereign over all, sovereign over every circumstance and trial he faced. And Christian contentment trusts in a wise and loving God. Contentment rests in accepting the truth that God has ordained every circumstance in my life. One writer said this of Paul. Paul had learned that the Christian life is not a series of accidents. It's a series of appointments and assignments. And that's true of us also. Our lives are not a series of accidents but rather in God's hands there are a series of appointments and assignments. The secret of contentment lies in understanding that nothing happens by chance, but everything is redeemed by the hand of a loving God. And contentment is possible when I realize that everything happens for a purpose, whether I understand it, whether I see it or not. Think about Augustine. He was reported to say that the heart is restless until it finds rest in God. But you know, David of old had learned the lesson and it inspired him to write Psalm 52. If you scan through the words of Psalm 62, you'll see that David says contentment is found not in things or people, it's only found in God. And you see, note how often he uses the word only. Verse 1, David says, My soul finds rest in God alone. Verse 2, he says, God alone is my rock. Verse 5, he repeats verse 1 saying, Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. And then again, he repeats verse 2 and verse 6, He alone is my rock. David is saying that God alone is the only object of trust and therefore contentment. He is not trusting something other than God for contentment, nor is he trusting God and something or God and someone. His trust is in God only, God alone. And this is something many Christians every day have forgotten. Our problem is not that we don't trust God, rather we don't trust God alone. Meaning that we always want to add something else to trust as well. And you know, that's not true trust. Someone once put it this way. They trust not in God at all, who trust not God alone. They trust not in God at all, who trust not in him alone. In verse 10, 
we encounter a familiar phrase, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. And Paul used that phrase to refer to his position as a child of God. And what does that status do? Well, it brings him joy. It also brings security and through that great contentment, he's rejoicing his position of being held firmly by a God, a God of care and a God of power. And as a consequence, he can rejoice in the Lord, not only for his salvation, but he can rejoice in the Lord even in his time of isolation and challenge. The secret to contentment is to rejoice in our substance, to rest in our situation, but then thirdly and finally, to realize our strength. To realize our strength. In verse 13, Paul says, I am able to do everything through him who gives me strength. And apparently this is one of the most tweeted Bible verses in all of Scripture. But often it's taken out of context. The popular Christian motivational speaker will use this verse to declare, you can do anything you want if you put your mind to it. You can do anything you really want to if you really believe in yourself and ask Jesus to help you. But you see, here Paul isn't making a categorical and comprehensive statement. He isn't saying as he sits under house arrest, I can break these chains, I can body slam these Roman guards, I can run out of the prison with lightning speed through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. No, that's not what he's saying. This verse doesn't mean that God will give you the strength to get anything you want and to avoid everything you don't want. Being in Christ, you see, isn't a get out of jail free card for every hardship in life. Indeed, Paul could tell you that it certainly wasn't in that because here he is in jail. You see, this verse doesn't promise success. It promises contentment. And the key to remember in this verse is its context. When Paul says, I can do everything or do all things through Christ, he's referring to what life throws at him. He's referring to those circumstances that he's been highlighting in the previous verse, verse 12. And you see, that's why one version says, I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength. Another version, I have strength to face all conditions by the power that Christ gives me. Paul is really saying no matter what the circumstances, no matter what trials I may face, no matter how difficult the road ahead, God will give me the strength to make it through. Whatever it is, whether in need or in plenty, whether hungry or well-fed, I can handle everything through him who gives me strength. And so the promise is not I can do anything I want, but rather I can do everything God calls me to do through him who gives me strength through Jesus Christ. Do you see, Jesus gives us power to face life's adversities. He gives us power and strength to cope. He gave Paul the power to enjoy contentment regardless of his circumstances, and he can do the same for us. You see, the dwelling Christ will give us strength we need for every situation. And Paul knows this by his experience. And so he seeks to direct us to Christ. He doesn't want us to be circumstance sufficient or self-sufficient, but rather Christ sufficient. And that's the key to contentment. You see, Paul here writing from a prison cell isn't preoccupied with his situation Rather, he's preoccupied with Jesus and the work of the gospel. And that's his secret. When you focus on Jesus, you can be content no matter what else is happening. Through God's strength, you can be content in the midst of a culture of discontent. Circumstances no longer have to dictate how you're doing. Because God can make you happier than the stuff of this world or the proverbial grass on the other side of the fence. God is the source of our contentment. But as I conclude, let me leave two thoughts, two challenges. First of all this, in this fallen world, contentment cannot be explained apart from the supernatural power of Jesus Christ. It can only be found, it can only be experienced, it can only be explained in a relationship with Christ. And secondly, the challenge is this. The church should be an alternative community in a culture 
of discontent. There's so much discontentment in our world. People are lacking satisfaction, fulfillment and joy. Christians should be content, should be joyful, should be satisfied and therefore be a witness in a world of discontent. Amen. Let's pray for a moment. Father, as we come to you, we acknowledge that so often we lack contentment. And yet we thank you that when our focus is on Jesus, we can know that same contentment that the Apostle Paul knew. Lord, forgive us when we stray from your path and help us to focus continually upon you. And in a world where there is so much discontentment, help believers to be different, to show that in Christ we have satisfaction, we have fulfillment, we have joy, we have true contentment. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us today and for the deep challenge. And we pray that through the enablement of your Holy Spirit within us, that we will display that contentment that is found only in Christ. And we pray that in a world where there is so much dissatisfaction, so much unrest, so much discontentment, that we might be a witness to others that in Christ we can find joy, satisfaction, and true and lasting contentment. We pray, Lord, that we would continue to know your blessing, that you will watch over all our congregations, all our friends and family, and that, Lord, we will know and experience your grace, your love, and your mercy. Lord, we ask these things in the lovely name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen.